We are now recording. All right. Thank you again, uh, Reverend Dr. Paul Hinlicky, for uh, sharing Bible study with us tonight. Um, is everybody seeing the PowerPoint that Dr. Henlicky's put together? Does it seem that's working? Okay, thank you, Colleen. See your chat there. We'll wanna Give it a few more minutes as people find their way to the room. Hope everybody is staying warm. I went for my usual walk this afternoon and came back. My face was frozen by the time I got home, uh, but it was nice to be out. We're down to 17 people who have not been assigned to a breakout room yet. So we're getting close. I hope the link to join uh, our Zoom session tonight was easier to find uh, than it was the last couple of days. I'm seeing some thumbs up. It's good to see. Um, what I have found throughout the pandemic is um, as we've been using new technology, we keep uh, fixing last week's problem at church uh, in terms of the camera and the sound and streaming on the web and stuff like that. And um, uh, with Zoom, it's been a little bit of that this week um, with uh, Power in the Spirit. We've tried some new things and that's meant uh, encountering some new challenges we hadn't faced before, but um, we're very fortunate to have people in the Senate office uh, like Tammy and uh, Lene, Becky and Emily who work on this stuff. So we can do things like this. I have okay. a question. I'm in the breakout room, but it says I'm viewing your screen. Yes. Uh, do you see um, where it says Power in the Spirit Bible yes. study? Yeah. Yes. So um, Dr. Henlicky's put together a um, uh, PowerPoint presentation, and I'll be running that while um, he is telling us about um, this chapter in the book of Hebrews. Oh, okay. Yep. <clears throat> and, well, uh, Dr. Henlicky, I think when you're ready, um, it'd be a good time for us to uh, begin our Bible study tonight. Thank you again for being with uh, the historic first ever Midwinter Power in the Spirit, um, entirely online. Appreciate you being here. Thank you, Pastor Dave. I'm pleased to be invited. Uh, I think I might just begin briefly with a word of prayer. The Lord be with you. Let us pray. Gracious Holy Spirit, you promise to be with the people who attend to your word. May your presence be with us all tonight as we contemplate the solidarity of God with us and by your spirit, our response, we with God. We ask it for the sake of our great high priest, Christ the Lord. Amen. Okay, let's go right away to the next screen, which has the text that uh, I've been asked to uh, uh, discuss with you all this evening. Uh, and I'm gonna ask Pastor Dave 
to break up the monotony of hearing my voice only if he would be the reader of the verses that are selected here. So Pastor Dave, take it away. Now in subjecting all things to human beings, God left nothing outside their control. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. For it is clear that he did not come to help angels, but the descendants of Abraham. Therefore he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. Let's begin just with some basic observations about this text. Um, what is striking is that it is a text that authorizes through the centuries, what we could call a kind of Christian humanism, that human beings are singled out as the special uh, covenant partner with God. And to be partners with God is a great and dignity and a great vocation assigned to the human race. And yet it is um, often subject to doubt, great doubt, because of the experience of suffering and because of the pall or the shroud cast over humanity by the experience and power of death. And our text then is singling out the human race as the frustrated covenant partner of God, frustrated because of a slavery created by the fear of death, a slavery assigned to a tyrant, the one who has the power of death, that is the devil, the enemy of God, and the enemy especially of God's covenant partner, humanity. And so the text is talking about how uh, through the uh, incarnation suffering death and exaltation of Jesus, this frustrated humanity is once again being rescued and redeemed and restored to its vocation. And this restoration of the human race to its vocation as the covenant partner of God comes about through the high priestly office of the crucified and exalted Jesus Christ, who is now the high priest in the heavenly places, as we'll see in detail as we go on through the study of the text. But we need now to put this text from chapter two into the larger context of the letter to the Hebrews. So let's go to the next slide. If we look carefully at the letter to the Hebrews, uh, we see that the treatise letter is motivated by the author's perceived perception of a danger 
in the, his Christian community, a danger that ranges from neglect of the community, uh, falling away from the means of grace, from the assembly of the community, uh, a neglect that can easily slide into apostasy on account of the fear of persecution. Now, we don't know concretely what the author is referring to. It's difficult to locate the letter to the Hebrews in a specific time and place, though we can say generally it's sometime after the death of the Apostle Paul and sometime after the destruction of the temple in Jerusalem in the year 70 of the first uh, century. And we can say generally that it's in a community that speaks a pretty sophisticated Greek language. So many have suggested perhaps Alexandria in Egypt, where there was a large Hellenistic Jewish uh, population and an early Christian community. In any case, we have some clues from the letter to the Hebrews itself about the situation in life to which the treatise is addressed. And these here are four verses. I'll ask Pastor Dave to read them one by one uh, that tell us, uh, that clue us in to the situation in life that the letter is addressing. Therefore, we must pay greater attention to what we have heard so that we do not drift away from it. Hebrews chapter two, verse one. Take care lest there be in any of you an evil, unbelieving heart leading you to fall away from the living God. Hebrews chapter three, verse 12. Do not neglect to meet together as is the habit of some but encouraging one another and all the more as you see the day drawing near. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 25. But recall those earlier days when after you had been enlightened, you endured a hard struggle with sufferings, sometimes being publicly exposed to abuse and persecution, and sometimes being partners with those so treated. For you had compassion for those who were in prison and you cheerfully accepted the plundering of your possessions, knowing that you yourselves possessed something better and more lasting. Hebrews chapter 10, verse 32. Okay, so what we can gather from these exhortations, uh, they're all exhortations, by the way, they're imperatives, they're encouragements. Uh, what we can gather <clears throat> is that earlier in the community's history, they endured a hard struggle, a persecution. And they, in this struggle, uh, they uh, endured with compassion for those who were in prison. They were in solidarity with the persecuted. And they even accepted the um, uh, theft, the plundering of their own possessions. Very interestingly, why they, tolerated that abuse is the author says because they themselves had a possession something better and more lasting and we'll see that that is for the author of the letter to the hebrews the hope of eternal life and glory with christ and then in looking back on that what we see is that some uh, are no longer paying attention to the Christian message that had first enlightened them. And because they're not paying attention to that, they're drifting away from it. And <clears throat> because they are drifting, <clears throat> excuse me, because they're drifting away uh, from that fundamental basic Christian message, uh, evil and unbelieving hearts are developing leading them away from the living God. Uh, this is a consequence of their failing to meet together, uh, where the encouragement uh, of one another in faith takes place, and the reinforcement of faith by attention to the Christian message uh, takes place. So I think all of that uh, is quite interesting. Uh, 
uh, because what the author of Hebrews is going to be showing us is that it matters to whom you give your ear. It matters uh, on where you focus your eyes. Uh, because we are embodied creatures, uh, we are not able to create ourselves or to create our own uh, identities or to create our own destinies. We are always dependent on the information that is coming into us from outside of ourselves. But the world is full of gospels. The world is full of messages of salvation. The world is full of all sorts of glitter and glamour and attractions. So where are you looking? To what are you lending your ear? This is not a question of neutrality. If you're not uh, attending to that basic Christian message, you will not have the, um, the believing heart which is able to encourage others in times of hard struggle or yourself to survive in times of being tested. Okay, let's go to the next slide. So the antidote, uh, this is what the letter to the Hebrews is uh, commending uh, to the congregation, the community that he's writing to on the assumption that they are being distracted, that their eyes have been diverted from attention and their ears are lending themselves to other voices. Uh, Pastor Dave, if you would read that, please. Look to Jesus, the pioneer and perfecter of our faith, who for the sake of the joy that was set before him endured the cross, disregarding its shame, and has taken his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Consider him who endured such hostility against himself from sinners, so that you may not grow weary or lose heart. Hebrews 12, verse 2. Okay, look and consider. Look, focus on the picture that the gospel narrative gives you of Jesus, who set his face to go up to Jerusalem, who pioneered this path. The gospel of Luke calls it a new exodus. Uh, after the transfiguration story, Jesus set his face to go up uh, to Jerusalem and discuss the exodus that he was about uh, to uh, uh, endure, referring to his passage through the cross uh, to the crown. So it is Jesus who is the pioneer, the trailblazer, the one who cuts the path in the new exodus. And in this way is the perfecter of our faith. That is to say, he's the one who completes uh, our faith. Uh, and when you look at Jesus, the author will suggest later on, you are in fact uh, attending to Jesus, the pioneer, and in this way, you're actually participating in his own uh, trailblazing path uh, through life. And of course, that's not meant literally. Sometimes the call to discipleship, can you can get the impression uh, that whatever Jesus did, you have to imitate. Uh, uh, this is a misunderstanding. The only way you could imitate Jesus or literally follow Jesus would be to get in some kind of science fiction time machine and fly back to the dusty byways of Galilee and find him there. And there literally you could follow him on his path. But the meaning here of following Jesus is not an imitation Martin Luther put it this way, it's not an imita imitatio carnis, it's not an imitation of the flesh, literally, to go back to Galilee and follow Jesus through the highways and byways. It's an imitatio mentis, it's an imitation of the mind, to have the mind of Christ, as Paul talks about in Philippians 2. And the mind of Christ was the willingness and the deliberate deliberateness with which Jesus, for the sake of the joy that was set before him, that is to say, the destination of his exodus, his entry into the holy, holy of gods, for the sake of that joy, his mind was to endure the 
cross, disregarding its shame, and thus to take his seat at the right hand of the throne of God. Looking to Jesus, that's the model that you see in his mind, his mentality. And the mind of Christ is to be yours by looking at Jesus in his intention. Likewise, then, you are to consider it not only looking to Jesus as the exemplar, the pioneer, the model, but you are to consider him, to uh, think it over, think th it through with your mind, how he endured such hostility from sinners, uh, so that that reflection on Jesus who trailblazed this path for us strengthens and encourages you when you likewise endure uh, hostility. That's the antidote that the letter of he Hebrews is recommending to a congregation uh, suffering from malaise, from neglect of the means of grace, from indifference and adrift into uh, uh, falling away into apostasy, and uh, also then in that context from the fear of future persecution uh, and shame and suffering. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, and as a result of this antidote, uh, the letter to the Hebrews is constantly exhorting the community to perseverance, to stick to uh, And therefore, uh, Brother Dave, if you would read these passages from Hebrews. Therefore, brothers and sisters, holy partners in a heavenly calling, consider that Jesus, the apostle and high priest of our confession, was faithful to the one who appointed him. Hebrews chapter 3, verse 1. Since then we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. Hebrews 4:14. 4, For we have become partners of Christ, if only we hold our first confidence firm to the end. Hebrews 3:14. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who has promised is faithful. Hebrews 10:23. Jesus also suffered outside the city gate in order to sanctify the people by his own blood. Let us then go to him outside the camp and bear the abuse he endured. Hebrews 13, 12. Yeah, thank you, uh, Pastor Dave. There, there's a number of things here to notice that I think are really interesting. Uh, I notice how the uh, texts refer to Christians as partners. Uh, the first text, holy partners in a heavenly calling. Third text, we have become partners of Christ. Uh, this is the idea that I mentioned earlier, that when you look uh, to Jesus, when you consider the mind that was in him, the willingness to endure the suffering of the exodus in order to reach the goal of the heavenly calling, uh, when you do that, it's actually faith is a kind of participation in Christ himself. Christ has, is, has the unique status of being the pioneer and the trailblazer. But Christ pulls disciples in his train when by faith they look upon him and give their ear to his word. And so that attending to Christ, uh, giving your attention to Christ, focusing on Christ, is, is not simply you know, an ordinary mental act of concentrating on reading a book or something like that. It's actually um, a uh, entrance into the, the, the wake of this ship plowing through the sea in, in, the, uh, in, the, in the, uh, the uh, impetus and the power of Christ's own movement that one disciples uh, by faith participate in his own way. Uh, and the only uh, then uh, uh, condition that is attached to this, and it's not a kind of a legalistic condition, but it's what in logic we call an analytical condition. It's true by definition. 
the only kind of condition for this is that we remain faithful to our confession, that we hold our first confidence firm to the end, the confession of our hope without wavering. Why is that so important to hold to the confession, to hold fast to our confession, hold fast to our confession? Because it's those other voices, those other gospels, those other uh, claims to liberation, those other powers that would enthrall us uh, and distract us from Christ, uh, it is those other powers that would detach us from this participation in Christ. And it's that confession of Christ which in turn provokes their hostility. Uh, the hostility of those other powers is caused by the early Christians holding to the mind of Christ and the path of discipleship that it charts out. And that's the object of their persecution. Now, it's interesting to know what we know about early Christian martyrdom and persecution. The key issue was whether Christians, when they were called before the magistrate or the tribunal, whether they would uh, make a symbolic uh, uh, offer of incense to the image of the Caesar, the emperor, and consequently would curse, deny, or renounce Christ. The son of God is Caesar sitting on his mighty throne, not disgraced Jesus, whose earthly life ended on a Roman gibbet. So they're Christian. Who is the son of God? Is it Caesar on the throne or is it Jesus on the cross? That's the confession of the suffering of the son of God to which we hold fast in our confession. And the persecutors somehow sensed that and went right for the juggler and wanted to get these Christians to renounce Christ in that respect. That's why the final verse uh, uh, points to Jesus's crucifixion outside the city gate uh, where his own blood was shed by the persecutors. And the exhortation then of to those who hold fast to the confession of this particular Christ is that they too, not literally, but in their, in their minds and therefore in their conduct of life, join Jesus outside the camp and bear the abuse that he endured there. So the exhortation to perseverance has these really interesting ideas for us to consider that we are partners with Christ, that discipleship is a participation in the exodus way that he has chartered for us, and that when we uh, join that exodus way in discipleship, it's actually Christ himself who was pulling us on this way through this train. The only analytical condition, not a legalistic condition, but true by analysis, is that we hold fast to our confession because the focus of our confession is that Christ, the Son of God, suffered and shed his blood and died outside the city gate. And when the persecutors come, that's exactly what they want us to renounce. But holding fast to this confession, therefore, we actually join Christ in his suffering. So the uh, letter to the Hebrews is arguing. Okay, let's go to the next slide. And here too, uh, now this is the idea uh, of the letter to the Hebrews that Jesus has in his own exodus trailblazing the way for us. Jesus has um, become, entered the Holy of Holies and become our great high priest. And that's why from where he is exalted in glory in the Holy of Holies, that's why he can still powerfully pull us who are on the way to where he is. Uh, David, if you would read these two verses. In the days of his flesh, Jesus offered up prayers and supplications with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. 
and he was heard because of his reverent submission. Although he was a son, he learned obedience through what he suffered. And having been made perfect, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him, having been designated by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 7. We have this hope, a sure and steadfast anchor of the soul, a hope that enters the inner shrine behind the curtain, where Jesus, a forerunner on our behalf, has entered, having become a high priest forever according to the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews chapter 6, verse 19. Yeah, some of the references here are pretty obscure to us, but they're all references, as we'll see shortly, to uh, Hebrew scripture, Old Testament discussions of what a priest is and what a temple is and what the function of a, uh, of a, of a priest is. The first text tells us that Jesus gained this position uh, of being a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek through the obedience he learned in suffering. Uh, this is the idea that Christ is not, as it were, simply a divine defense, uh, dispenser of uh, benefits, but that Christ's benefits have been acquired or gained by his life of obedience and his life of obedience came through uh, the obedience even to death, death upon a cross. And it was on account of that actual righteousness, not just the righteousness of the Son of God by nature, but the righteousness of the incarnate Son who learned obedience through suffering, that, that it's by virtue of that that he has entered the inner shrine behind the curtain. That's a reference to the tabernacle into the Holy of Holies, uh, where he is therefore uh, in the very uh, 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 near proximity to, to the almighty God. Okay, let's go to the next slide, please. Okay, so here's some background. Uh, what does this obscure references to Melchizedek and the Holy of Holies and so forth and being a high priest, what does it all mean? Well, here the Hebrew scripture background is important. Uh, on the high priest, the high priest is the one who makes atonement for the whole congregation. You can read that in Leviticus chapter 4. And the one who makes atonement for the whole congregation on Yom Kippur does so by the right, the sole right to enter the Holy of Holies, that is to be in the near proximity of, to God, uh, figuratively speaking, to be at the right hand of God, where uh, the priest can then make intercession and atonement for the whole congregation. So in ascribing this function to, uh, to Jesus, the letter to the Hebrews is telling us that what the uh, high priest of the tabernacle and temple in the history of Israel did anticipated what Jesus Christ does now at the right hand of God. Uh, he, has, he makes their intercession and atonement for the whole congregation. Uh, now, here's some history about this. After the collapse of the monarchy uh, and the exile uh, of Judah and Benjamin to Babylon, uh, uh, and then the return from exile to Jerusalem and the rebuilding of the temple, after the collapse of the monarchy, the high priest didn't exist for a number of years. And when it was resumed, it took on a role of political leadership. You can see that in the books of Ezra and Nehemiah. But this arrangement ended when Antiochus IV deposed the high priest, according to 2 Maccabees 4. And from that time on through the time of Jesus, the high priests were appointed by political authorities willy-nilly. Uh, and even this came to an end with the destruction of the Jerusalem temple in the year 70. Uh, now, 
and already because of the corruption of the temple establishment and its politicization under Herod and under Roman occupation, there were messianic expectations circulating about the coming of a heavenly high priest, especially in Qumran and the Essenes. So what, what you have here, I think for the letter to the Hebrews, is the disaster of the year 70 when the Jerusalem temple was destroyed and its worship was ended and there was no more earthly priest uh, in Jerusalem in the temple on earth. And the collapse of that form of Jewish uh, solidarity as a result of the Roman war and the end of the temple service provoked the reflection that what could all of scripture's testimony to the role and function of the high priest now mean? And this was the occasion for the creative work of the author of the letter to the Hebrews to take up this role and to see uh, envision how Jesus Christ in his uh, res resurrection glory is the one who now fulfills it, not in an earthly temple, but in the heaven of heavens, in the presence of God, on behalf of the whole congregation. And it is from there that he summons and pulls forward his people uh, to the destiny where, destination that he has come to. Now, let's look at the our te specific text verse by verse then to the next slide. Jesus, uh, Pastor Davery, the... Uh, Italics, please. There we go. As it is, we do not yet see everything in subjection to them, but we do see Jesus, who for a little while was made lower than the angels, now crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death, so that by the grace of God he might taste death for everyone. So what does this mean? It means in the chaos and confusion of threatening persecution, neglect, and creeping infidelity, we look at Jesus. And what do we see when we see Jesus? According to this text, we see the Lord of the universe in the person of his son suffering our death. I don't know if I did this acronym correctly. This I'm dating myself, but those my age can remember when WYSIWYG was a thing as in, in computers. What you see is what you get, WYSIWYG. And here again, as I said at the beginning, you become what you behold. You become what you lend your ears to. Where do you attend? Where do you focus your attention? There are many gospels propagating many lords with many liberations and salvations on the market out there. And they can captivate you with a lot of glitter and glamour. And what you look at when you see Jesus is the one who is crowned with glory and honor because of the suffering of death. And that's not so easy uh, 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 to um, uh, buffalo people with. It's not easy to market a suffering Messiah. Uh, especially when the suffering of the Messiah invites you into that path of discipleship, of suffering with him, and so forth. Uh, but that's what's at stake in the Christian message. And Martin Luther, actually in 1519, wrote a commentary on the letter to the Hebrews. And he had some really powerful observations on this meaning. So the uh, second bullet, Thus, to bear Christ crucified in oneself is to live, live a life full of trials and sufferings. And for this reason, he becomes for carnal man a sign that is spoken against. Now, notice what Luther says. You, it's not easy to sell a crucified Christ because when you are proclaiming a crucified Christ, with whom you are have become partners in discipleship, you will share in his sufferings, trials and sufferings. And that's why for uh, people whose minds are not spiritual, but carnal to use 
Paul the Apostle's language, uh, he is uh, rejected, a sign that is spoken against. Positively, Luther continues, for spiritual people, not carnal people, here the Holy Spirit consoles us in order that in the time of suffering we may have patience and hope. Tribulation lasts for a little while, but the consolation is eternal. This is, of course, the idea of St. Paul in Romans 8, that the sufferings of this present age are not worthy to be compared to the glory which is to come. And so we see that for the letter to the Hebrews, like for Romans 8, uh, Jesus has uh, uh, attained to the destination of a redeemed humanity of eternal life in the presence of God. Uh, and that is the pearl of great price. That's what's worth bearing the suffering, the trial, and uh, enduring uh, uh, the, the cost of discipleship. Next slide, please. And I title this next uh, several verses, The Solidarity of God with Us, uh, because it proclaims the true glory of the incarnation, that in suffering for us, uh, Jesus establishes the solidarity of God with us as we really are and not as we fancy ourselves to be, but as we really are uh, in our trials and sufferings. David, if you would read that, please. It was fitting that God, for whom and through whom all things exist, in bringing many children to glory, should make the pioneer of their salvation perfect through sufferings. For the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified all have one Father. For this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters, saying, I will proclaim your name to my brothers and sisters. In the midst of the congregation, I will praise you. And again, I will put my trust in him. And again, here am I and the children whom God has given me. I, for this reason, Jesus is not ashamed to call them brothers and sisters. Uh, this is really actually quite remarkable because many of us brothers and sisters are ashamed of ourselves. Shame is a dirty little secret. It's a part of human life and it's a power play with which we shame others and uh, become ashamed ourselves. Uh, in Paul Gerhardt's great Advent hymn, we hear the line, I stood my shame bemoaning, you came to honor me, confessing this Jesus who uh, 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 should make the, uh, this Jesus who is not ashamed to join us in our sorrows and woes and difficulties. Uh, and that, I think, is something that's quite remarkable. It's kind of easy to proclaim a cheap incarnation that everything is grace and everything is sweetness and light and God is in everything or something like that. <clears throat> and the rubber hits the road when you talk about the solidarity of God with us in our sorrows, woes, and difficulties. And that's, of course, where we need the message of the gospel of Christ the most. Because in our own sorrows, woes, and difficulties, they're always uh, compromised, or they're always amplified by a sense of shame that I'm failing, that I'm falling apart, that I'm not standing up, that I'm not healthy, that I'm not wealthy, that I'm not wise. And all these kinds of attacks on our basic humanity, which is, as we heard shortly now, is the work of the devil. Next slide, please. So Christ conformed to us in suffering and death in order that our conformity to Christ come about by the faith which sees Jesus rightly as the one who enters heavenly glory by the way of suffering on the cross. And here Luther has a couple of really powerful thoughts about this that I've been kind of emphasizing. 
what spectacle do you attend? To what message do you lend your ears? Luther writes, thus through the gospel, as through a spectacle exhibited to the whole world, Christ attracts all by the knowledge and contemplation of himself and draws them away from the things to which they have clung in the world. In this way, Christ is the cause and leader of salvation, for he draws and leads. Now notice this next comment. I think this is so uh, significant. For he does not compel men to salvation by force and fear, but by this, uh, we should say, spiritually, not carnally pleasing spectacle of his mercy and love, his compassion, his solidarity with us in our so sorrows. He moves and draws all through love, all whom he will save. And now, <clears throat> the next passage introduces a dramatic thought. How does this spectacle actually work to, to liberate us, to set us free from the fear of death and the tyranny of the devil? How does it actually, how, do, how does it have traction on us? How does it actually work to do this? How does this spectacle grab a hold of us, take hold of us, and pull us to that heavenly goal? And this is what Luther says. For just as Christ, by reason of his union with his immortal divinity, overcame death by dying, so also the Christian, by reason of his union with the immortal Christ, a union which comes about through faith in him, what I talked about earlier as being partners in Christ. So the Christian also overcomes death by dying. And now this very interesting but difficult thought for us to understand. In this way, God destroys the devil through the devil himself and accomplishes his own work by means of an alien work. Wow. What a thought that is. Somehow, through the Christian's willingness to die with Christ, to suffer and die with Christ, uh, God overcomes the tyranny of the devil, which is the fear of death, and actually causes the devil to destroy his own malicious work and accomplish God's saving work by means of this devilish self-destruction. That's what Luther's saying. What on earth can that mean? Next slide. David, if you would read the italics, that's the verse we're interpreting. Since therefore the children share flesh and blood, he himself likewise shared the same things, so that through death he might destroy the one who has the power of death, that is the devil and free those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. How does this happen? How does it, is it that through death, Jesus, through his own dying, Jesus destroys the one who has the power of death and, and through his own death, frees those who all their lives were held in slavery by the fear of death. And the answer is God with us really means also we with God. God with us really establishes also we with God. The children share flesh and blood. And likewise, uh, um, Jesus shared the same things, God with us. But that means if God truly has been with us in the suffering and death of Christ, even in our death, we are with God. Now, God with us does not depend on our reciprocation in faith, hope, and love. God's love for us in Christ is unconditionally given and offered. God with us does not depend on our reciprocation, we with God. But surely God seeks us to be with God, and God's purpose is frustrated without this reciprocation, we with God. Now, if 
behind the sloth, neglect, and fear of suffering persecution, Hebrews diagnoses a fearful bondage attributed to the enemy of God, that liar and murderer from the beginning, the devil. So how does it happen that this devil lies and murdering is defeated? God with us is fulfilled, fulfilled when we, being sought and found even in the ultimate isolation of death, are liberated from fearful slavery through Christ's solidarity with us, producing our conformity to Christ. We with God being conformed to Christ uh, through dying with him to sin and rising with him to newness of life. Next slide. By this wonderful wisdom of God, Luther writes, God compels the devil to work through death nothing else than life. So that in this way, while the while the he acts most of all against the work of God in persecuting Christ, he acts for the work of God and against his own work with his own, um, you can't see the text there. For thus the devil worked death in Christ, but Christ has completely swallowed up death in himself through the immortality of his divinity and rose again in glory. This Here Luther is picking up the patristic idea of, the, uh, of Christus victor, Christ's victory over the devil. Christ let himself be uh, persecuted and put to death by the devil, but the devil overreached. In putting Christ to death, uh, he then unveiled his divinity and overpowered the devil and deprived him of his right over humanity because the devil had overreached and uh, attacked the righteous Christ, who in his powerful act of rising from the dead, uh, delegitimated the devil, took away his rights, and liberated his captives, the human race. And Christ uh, is therefore the victor over the devil. Uh, and this patristic motif Luther here is picking up for us. Next slide. And uh, I think we're getting here to the end here, David, this last verse here. Therefore, he had to become like his brothers and sisters in every respect, so that he might be a merciful and faithful high priest in the service of God to make a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Sometimes the idea that Christ is an atonement for sins is pitted against the idea of Christ as the victor over the devil. But in fact, Luther unites the two, just like the text of Hebrews does here. Christ is both the one who forces the devil to do God's saving work by putting Christ to death so that Christ in his death could then overpower and dethrone the tyrant devil and the fear of death, that's Christ the victor. Uh, but at the same time, uh, this Christ the victor is the one who through that death made a sacrifice of atonement for the sins of the people. Christ, uh, Luther does not play these two motifs off against each other, but unites them. And he sees that the way that the devil loses the right or the tyranny over human beings is through the forgiveness of sins. If the devil can no longer shame people, if the devil can no longer point to their sins and accuse them and say they're unworthy of God's love, if the devil has lost that right because the forgiveness of sins has taken away the sins of the people, then the devil is defeated and his ability to shame is ended. Christ's victory for us over the fear of death and the tyranny of the devil is therefore at the same time reconciliation with God by the forgiveness of sins. This is Luther's familiar idea that I stress every chance I get of the joyful exchange. Here I'm quoting. Christ considered that uh, the things that were our, 
Christ considered the things that were ours, not those that were his. For his things were righteousness, wisdom, salvation, glory, peace, joy, etc. Ours were sin, foolish, perdition, dishonor, the cross, sorrow. Therefore, he took these things of ours and acted as if he did not know his own. Uh, this is the joyful exchange. Christ comes in the gospel and says to the believer, give me your sin. I am the Lamb of God who bears away the sin of the world. And in turn, take my righteousness, the righteousness that I have gained by my obedience through sufferings, death, and the cross to gain entrance to the holy of holy, a pioneer for you, a trailblazer to bring you to the same glory in which I now stand. That's the joyful exchange. Christ takes all our negatives in order to give us all of his positives. He is the priest who offers not another, but his himself in the holy of holies, interceding there for them so that they too may enter there at last. Last slide, I think. Is this the last slide, David? Uh, I can't tell. Let's see. Yes, okay. I think so. Oh, yep. no. Put it oh. back up for a minute. <laughs> That's hard. There we go. All right. Would you read the text, please, at the top? Yep. Yeah. Because he himself was tested by what he suffered, he is able to help those who are being tested. All right. How is Christ able to help us who are in trial and affliction? Victory over the devil and fear of death and peace with God by the forgiveness of sins through the intercession of Christ, our high priest, yields in us believers the new freedom. The new freedom, or the Augsburg Confession calls this new freedom the new obedience to glorify God by sharing with others the love in which we have been loved. It's really true. God with us enables us to be with God, we with God, God with us, we with God. That God with us does not depend on we being with God, but it surely seeks and desires us to be with God. Therefore, when by neglect or apathy, we cease to look to Jesus as he is portrayed in the gospel, we fall back into fear and in fear, the temptation to neglect apostasy becomes powerful and easily rationalized. When the spectacle on display in the churches is anything other than the way Jesus pioneered for his people, that church itself has fallen away. For the letter to the Hebrews, nothing truly helps, but looking at Jesus who can and does help this way in the time of trial. Okay, thanks everybody for your attention. Uh, we have some minutes left here, I think, for a little discussion, if anybody wants to raise a question or an objection or a comment. I think what I'll suggest is if you find the chat feature, um, that would, uh, that's a great way, since there's about 42 of us, that's a great way to start submitting um, some questions, and I'll be happy to read those, and while people are finding that, it should be, depending on what device you're on, um, there's a chat feature towards the bottom of your screen. Um, Dr. Hinlicky, I thank you for your presentation. I'm curious, um, knowing that our church, we're from many different churches here tonight, and churches are in various stages of coming together and also staying apart, given the situation of the last year. Yeah. And um, I'm curious if you have any uh, idea what it means to keep um, um, keep our focus in the right place as we start taking those steps together um, to back together and um, uh, what what we need to avoid um, letting have our attention. Uh, this is a um, a time. It's a fraught time for a lot of churches as we're uh, navigating the the time ahead of us. I think it's a, you asked my opinion, this is not the gospel, it's just my opinion, but in, in my considered opinion, and I think this aligns with the message from the letter to the Hebrews, the pandemic has been a time of winnowing 
for the churches. It's been a divine shakeup. What really are you about and what really do you stand for? To whom really do you give your ear? Where really are you attending? What are you looking to? What is the central message of the church, the message that only the church can provide? And if the church does not provide it, it is not spoken at all. I think these are very probing questions put to all of us. And as we think about rebuilding congregational life, when at last uh, the isolation and uh, uh, caused by the lockdowns and the pandemic, and also the depression and anxiety and fear caused by the economic catastrophe associated with the virus uh, in this past year, which is also threatening the vitality of our congregations. Uh, how will we rebuild? On what basis? When this past year has also meant so many people have been lending their ears to perhaps to other messages and putting their focus on other distractions. I just leave those as questions. Thank you. Uh, we've received a question from Anne and John Hess. Um, thinking in, about the Exodus event or Exodus's metaphor, um, what, what might we, um, uh, what, are, what do we leave behind and uh, to what are we led? And is the ultimate hope simply life after death or is, is there another aim of the Christian life uh, rather than simply life after death? Well, I certainly think it's, 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 it's more, more than, a, or not simply life after death. But of course, the letter to the Hebrews uh, would want to put it this way. It's not simply my personal immortality. It is my joining that great cloud of witnesses in the eternal beloved community of God. And how that is to be conceived is certainly something more than simply some kind of personal psychological survival of death. It's rather the victory of the God of life over all the forces of death. It's rather the victory of community over isolation. It's rather the victory of faith over doubt. Uh, you can go on and on and on articulating positively. Uh, but the fundamental metaphor, scriptural type, I would say even stronger than metaphor of Exodus is, is extremely important here. One leaves behind the disgrace of Egypt. One leaves behind the life in t under the tyranny, the life of slavery. One leaves behind the forgetfulness of God. One uh, comes to the promised land flowing with milk and honey. One comes to uh, uh, the uh, new life lived in equality and peace and righteousness and holiness on the earth. Uh, so, you know, the letter to the Hebrews does have a kind of um, platonic cast, you know, going from the earthly to the heavenly. Uh, but we can balance that with other uh, New Testament witnesses, and for me, for example, most of all, above all, it's Romans chapter 8, which tells us about the vindication of the whole suffering creation uh, by the glorious liberty of the children of God. Thank you. Um, other questions for Dr. Hinlicky? Probably have one or two. Oh, we've got a long one here. Let's see. Oh, this is from Dave Delaney. Uh, Dave, do you want to read your question? <laughs> <laughs> I don't want to read your question. I can do that. Thank well, you. it's just that when, you know, for years, Paul, when I've been, whenever I'd read Hebrews and just kind of really get into it, it's, it's, it can feel awfully conditioned oriented. I mean, it's right. like, you know, you're, you're, it's like you're either with us or you're against us. I mean, it, it, you can read it that way. And I'm often tempted to fall into that. And I'm, I, I either end up worrying that the requirements are more than I can do. And I think, oh boy, forget this. <laughs> or, or I end up tempted to use those conditions as a kind of weapon against those who I judge to be lazy. And I think, well, I want to know who's on the inside. I want to know who's on the outside. So 
is there a guiding phrase or a short reminder that I, that I can just keep close at hand when I'm reading this book to turn to as a way of reorienting, reorienting myself when I'm reading this letter? You know, I'm thinking of Luther's, like when he was tempted, he would say, I remember that I'm baptized, something that pithy and close at hand. Uh, what's a good thing for reading Hebrews that, that helps? Look to Jesus, the author and pioneer of our faith, I guess. <laughs> That's about that's that's the, to me the antidote. That's that's the fundamental exhortation. Uh, now you're right; it is an exhortation. It's not a promise. It's an exhortation. It's an instruction. Uh, and I think we have to understand that the genre that the author of the letter employs reflects the urgent situation of apostasy and persecution. I think that under those dire circumstances, we can allow for this stylistic, this is not the sweet promises of the gospel kind of literature that Luther uh, always encouraged us, uh, is us to frame our reading of the New Testament with, but it is like the book of Revelation. It's written to a situation in which uh, apostasy and persecution are on the horizon. And people are getting distracted, neglecting word and sacrament, falling away from the community, failing to encourage one another, and so forth. In other words, and the author wants through this whole treatise to show us again and again and again, to show us Jesus, the author and pioneer of our faith. Uh, I think that's how I would have to answer this question. By the way, your anxiety about this is not off, uh, off base. There is a passage early in the letter to the Hebrews, I can't remember the chapter and verse exactly, which says, having once been enlightened, there was no second repentance. Now this is, uh, uh, seems to be saying that if you sin after baptism, baby, you've lost it all. <laughs> and this is how this text was interpreted by the Donatists uh, in the early church and how it was interpreted in the medieval Catholic tradition that uh, if you sin after baptism, you've fallen out of grace. And that's why the medieval church developed a sacrament of penitence in which you actually had to restore. Uh, uh, penance was a second, uh, 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 a second plank thrown out of people who have made a shipwreck of their baptism so that you could you know, swim your way back into a state of grace through penance, right? So yes, there is, you can read, if you don't take into account the context of persecution and which, which uh, on the face of it, you can misunderstand some of these rather dire exhortations, I think. Uh, we have about three, two minutes left, and we've got a question. Uh, did God or the devil require that Jesus be crucified? Two minutes. Well, according to Jesus, God did, didn't he? Right? That's right. In the Garden of Gethsemane, uh, in the three passion predictions in the gospel, Jesus uses the divine passive. It is necessary that the Son of Man uh, be rejected and uh, suffer and be crucified, etc. Uh, but in the Gospel of Luke, uh, it's the devil who enters into the heart of Judas and provokes him to betray Christ. And when Christ is erect, uh, arrested in the Gospel of Luke, Jesus says, uh, put away your uh, weapons, for this is your hour and the power of darkness. So the answer to the question is not either or, in some way it's both. And that's kind of what what Luther is pointing at when he says he, God uses the devil uh, to do his uh, to do a work that destroys the devil and accomplishes God's purpose. The devil is not the equal of God, and whatever the devil is permitted to do is permitted by divine permission, uh, and ultimately under the sovereignty of God. I'm answering that from the perspective of Luther. 30 seconds to go. Um, that's great. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Hinlicky, uh, for 
spending time with Power in the Spirit uh, this week and sharing your reflections on a um, fascinating chapter in the book of Hebrews. Uh, we will we will all, we can either leave the breakout room now or we will be booted back to the big room in nine seconds. So either way, I will see you all there. Okay, thank you all, bye-bye. Thank you.